Welcome back for the final session of today. Two days flew by, I would say. Um, very, very good days, in my, in my opinion. Um, so we'll have the final session, and it's a session for reflection. It's a session for us to basically think about what, what, have, what did we achieve, what did we do, and what do we need to do in, on, the, on the path forward. And we'll have a few uh, panelists to, to share some reflections with you uh, later on, but we'll also give you a chance to, to share with us and also with your conference organization some of the reflections that you might have had after these two days of, of conferencing. Um, but before we, we go on to that part of the, of, the, of the program, maybe a few things that I wanted to, to highlight. First, these, just to go back to yesterday, yesterday's Menti exercise, these are some of the things that you wanted to get out of this conference. So maybe the question is, did you get out of, did you get out what, of the conference what you wanted to get? And I was particularly interested uh, whether the people um, who wrote this got, out, got that out of it. So <laughs> did the people... <laughs> Did the people who wanted free wine get, get their free wine? Did the people who get, wanted whiskey get some whiskey? And most importantly, did the person who wanted a date get a date? Let's see. You tell me. You don't have to tell it right now in front of everyone. But... Right, so then maybe just to, to also return to the exercise, because I thought it was, was quite telling, and, and some of the insights that we got were quite telling. So we have a few final questions uh, for all of you to be addressing in, in, this, in this final session. So let's hope that Menti actually works with me this time, and let's hope that the questions that I'll be seeing are the questions that you'll be seeing on your mobile phone. So please go back to menti.com and enter 110563. Give you a few seconds to do so. Right, then let's move to what I hope is the first question that you see. I would come to this conference again. Is this a question that you're seeing? Yeah. Hurrah. In one year, in two years, or maybe you think, well, this is ridiculous, I'll never come back again. <laughs> of course, we hope that that was not the case, but so far it's not. Good, good. So you do know that actually organizing conferences like this does take two years. <laughs> you trying to influence the result. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, right there. There it goes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Okay, we need to work harder, Michael. Okay. I think that's the, that's the message. Right, okay, so people like the conference. I'm very happy to see no one, no one responded, never. You still have a chance to do it now, of course, but... Um, I'm also happy to see that you want to do it more. And I think that's also a good sign. Like we want to engage with the same people that are here and like-minded people also who couldn't be here today more. And I think that's a good sign. Let's see if you get to the next question as it's li linked here. Again, give me some ideas. What did you get out of the conference? Did you indeed get ideas, inspiration, whiskey, dates, and so on? Did you, is that the stuff that you got out of the conference? Or were there maybe other surprising things that you got out of the conference that you didn't expect? <laughs> <laughs> Headaches, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Hangover, those are the people who were, went to the pub last night. Inspiration, which is also one of the words that was, that was very much on there yesterday morning. And again, it gives an idea that, that, that we want to go home and do more. Ideas, narratives, contacts, all good. And again, sorry about that headache, but I think it might have to do with that hangover as well. <laughs> and the whiskey. Right, excellent. Right, next question. And also, this is also already starting with some of the feedback from the conference organization. So, what would you like to see more of? Maybe there were some sessions which, which teased your brain a little bit, but you actually would, would have liked to see much more of that. And maybe there were, were other sessions you would like to see less of. That's going to be the next question. But what, what was, 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 was something that you think we need much more of this? Maybe more research, more, more action. But we <laughs> there you go, more action. Um, but also maybe in terms of topics, were there certain topics that you felt were under-addressed? Other topics maybe they were over-addressed? More campaign focus, more political economy. A lot of different ideas here. More visualization, more strategy. 
more diversity. Also very important point. And again, this is feedback. We, we've got some feedback, of course, after the previous conference as well. And some of the comments that, that, are, that are in here, I think, are also resonating uh, with the comments that, that we got two years ago. Some of these things are, of course, not always easy to, to address. But I think this is actually qu quite telling already. Country context, of course, we need to look at specific implementation of some of these questions that we've been looking at. More economic city economists. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Then, next question, what do you think we might see, want to see less of? Like, what do you think was actually m maybe a bit overrepresented, and we know by now? So, what are the, what, again, give us some feedback on what do you think is maybe not the best thing to focus on. And it doesn't mean that it's irrelevant, it doesn't mean that we, we can't focus on it at all, but just give us some ideas of what, what would we like to see less. <laughs> less PowerPoints, yes. Less of Trump. I think he was not that fresh. There was, were a few photos. I'm sorry, I, I was guilty of one of them. But less climate modeling, less economics. Come on, economists, where are you? <laughs> less of Norway. <laughs> Heretics. <laughs> I, I apologize for all the Norwegians in the room. Right. Again. <laughs> then going back to some, one of the questions that we, we asked originally, and I, I remember the number that, that we ended up with. So it's, my, it's interesting to see where we ended up now. I guess our sample is maybe slightly smaller than it was at the beginning. Um, at the same time, this is actually a good sign. 9.4. So we were at 8.6. So Maybe the sample, the, the smaller sample size means that, that the, the people who are a bit skeptical have, have actually left by now. <laughs> 8.9, roughly, roughly the same, a bit more to the right. Then the final question, it's a very, very important question also considering the future of, of, of what we're doing here and the future of, of this community. So um, hopefully you can give an honest answer to this question. So not, not looking at anyone in particular, but may, may, maybe... <laughs> there you go, two, two. Excellent. <laughs> Three people. So you can find us after the, after the conference ends. <laughs> yeah, we actually loaded trackers on. Today. Yeah. <laughs> we know who you are. <laughs> Right, I'll close the mentee there, but thanks again. I thought this was really nice. The responses were really good. Put the slide up and then move to the final panel of today. So we have four people here, um, four experts, I would say, that are going to share with us uh, their reflections um, that they have had with the conference, that they had from the conference uh, in the last two days. So. They already know the questions that are coming, so, but, but I'll first introduce, uh, introduce each of them um, in turn. So next to me is Joanna De Pledge, and uh, you've probably already seen her. Uh, she is the editor of the Climate Policy Journal, uh, but not just that. She's also had uh, experience in the climate change negotiations for, I think, over 20 years, if, if not more. Um, and basically, I would say she's an expert not only in international climate policy, but also on, on fossil fuel producers and how they interact with, with international climate policy. Um, then next to Joanna is Asiya al -Guyasim. I hope I uh, got your name pro properly. And Asiya is, uh, with the, the, is a policy uh, expert with the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, also known as the OECD to most of you. Um, and she has been working on, on fossil fuel subsidies in particular, uh, together with Ron Steenblik, who is still with us. Um, and she's going to, to basically take over that work and it's going to be very important in, in tracking fossil fuel subsidies in, in the future. Um, because that's still not enough, she's also finishing her PhD, I think at Sciences Po in, in Paris, uh, focusing on the macroeconomics of uh, resource producers. Then next to Asia we have Roberto Schäfer, and Roberto, uh, who is, um, I should also say, he's also a member of the steering committee of this conference, and has been very supportive uh, of this work from the, from the very beginning. Um, and he is a professor at the, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, 
Um, and then finally, we have Sheila Whitley from the Overseas Development Institute, where she's the head of the Climate and Energy Program. And Sheila, you all know uh, very much for her work on fossil fuel subsidies, but also more generally, green fiscal policy and private climate finance. So I would say an excellent panel to, to end this conference with. Um, and the question, as I said to, to the panel and as I sent to the panel already, uh, that I wanted to, to ask them at the beginning is what would you say are your three main takeaways, but also what was the one thing that actually really stood out? What was the one thing that really surprised you? So we'll just take them in, 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 in the order that I just introduced you. So let's start with Joanna. The floor is yours. So you want the surprise and the takeaways? The three takeaways and the surprise. Okay, so um, my surprise came within the first maybe five minutes uh, of the conference, uh, which was to see that only four people voted for the UN um, as the main source of hope for change in um, uh, supply-side fossil fuel policy. And as someone that's worked a lot in the UN, I thought that was uh, a little bit troubling. Um, but then throughout the conference, I think that was probably just a question of interpretation or language, because it seemed that you know, at least half, if not three quarters, of the presentations that I sat in on uh, mentioned the Paris Agreement and the two degree, one degree net zero as real drivers um, of policy change. So clearly international regimes still are very much part of um, the mood music that helps to direct uh, policy. And I did want to mention my other very small surprise, which was that the um, American Petroleum Institute knew all about the dangers of climate change in 1959, if you weren't there for uh, Benjamin Franta's excellent uh, talk. Um, should we just do the surprises first? or? Uh, yeah, why don't we just yeah. start with the surprises and then and then we'll go for the, the takeaways. Thanks. Asia? Yeah, I think I think for me what I what was not so um, straightforward uh, or at least like I didn't get to think about it that much is to see how a lot of demand policies have uh, made the consumption of fossil fuels um, uh, less uh, less important uh, domestically, but then are betting on export markets uh, for their products and revenues. And I think um, this the confluence of different papers and different country policies uh, leading to um, this bet on um, uh, trade uh, as a solution for for um, their fossil fuel resources has uh, has definitely been something that I will take away and uh, think about a little bit more um, for uh, our work uh, at the OECD. Okay, first of all, I think my my big surprise to see that I'm a minority here in this table. So this is one of my surprises. But the, the real one, let's say, was to learn that, let's say, uh, supply side measures probably will be much more difficult to implement than I thought before. And the reason I'm saying that was to see the reaction from countries that are already, let's say, in the declining curve of oil production, that already have a very high standard of living, and they still see a problem of reducing, let's say, oil production. So if that's true for Norway, for California, etc., I don't think this is going to work. Because if developing countries are counting on oil for economic development, social justice, and how are we going to try to convince them to keep oil and coal down, let's say, below ground, if the most developed countries also say that they cannot live without it. So this was my big surprise to learn here. Um, my surprise is actually a bit more about the conference itself. Um, really, really pre pleasantly surprised at how many new faces um, are here uh, and how much actually there's a kind of amazing combination of new faces, so new opportunities, new colleagues, new partnerships, but actually even in the last panel, two pieces of research that I didn't know about that are very connected to either work we're doing or partners are doing, where almost just when you have one rogue study, it's not going to get traction. But if you have, once you can kind of start to triangulate with others and understand how they, what methodology they use and all the rest of it. So really like great new faces and also very tangible opportunities, like very near term opportunities for collaboration. Excellent. And it's good to reflect on both the, the substance, of course, but also on, on the conference itself. Um, and I also encourage you to do that, do so later. Um, then maybe the, the second part of the question is the, the takeaways. And maybe we can start on, on Sheila's end um, now. So 
whether it's two or three takeaways, but what were the, the key things that, that, that you're going to take home with you and, and, and act upon? Um, this is the hard, hard questions. Um, so I think really this somehow from the very beginning panel, which was this question of like, are we, if we work on this, are we undermining demand side conversations? Are we saying they're not valid? So how do we really think about from the beginning linking the supply and demand in a way that doesn't deflect from the fact that a lot of work has been done on the demand side and therefore we need to focus on supply. And a couple of places where I saw some really interesting opportunities for that is even in the last panel, there was kind of a, how do we talk about using windfall, instead of having windfall profits to companies, how do you use those windfall profits kind of in different ways? How do you use um, revenues, well, which are not fiscal space created through fossil fuel subsidy reform? And then there's this conversation about on the demand side, how do you use um, kind of the resources generated through carbon pricing? And what I find interesting is here, there's a lot of conversation about, oh, we should put it all to renewables, where I sort of feel like on the carbon pricing side, we've said like, we shouldn't be hypothecating, it should go to general public resources, it should be used for things that the public think are priorities because you'll get more public support. So kind of linking, it feels like there's a real opportunity to think about lessons on the kind of political economy, but also kind of fiscal policy management on the demand side and the supply side, where we could be maybe leap, kind of moving faster because we've been thinking about them on both sides. Um, I guess the other one is sort of linked to this as well, but also how does supply side um, campaigning really push the demand side action, like more ambition on the demand side action, which I think may have just happened in California. Be interesting to talk more about that. It may have come up in a lot of the campaigning com side events because I or parallel events because I haven't been in them but I think it's really important to think about that and then lastly I thought this narrative point about I think it was Ben who raised this sort of points about the terminology we use and even if we can't use the different terminology than kind of what companies want us to use how do we think about that differently and again because we're sort of in the beginning of creating a space how do we do that early on Excellent. thanks Roberta okay well I was here two years ago so I I have some parameters to compare what I saw two years ago and now. And this time I saw a little bit more, uh, more science behind the discussions here, but I still saw a lot of, let's say, activism and, and advocacy, advocacy. I think, let's say, activism and advocacy are very important, good, but I think these have to be more backed or backed by science. So I'd like to see more different from some people that wrote what they did not like here. I think we should rely more on models, more on economics to try to really see that the economic implications of divestment or keeping oil and coal in the ground. So I think it's not just because you want that to happen, but we have to have, let's say, the proper metrics to show the implications, the social implications, the economic implications of doing that. If you do not do that and show that it's better to keep oil and coal in the ground, it will be difficult to justify just because, let's say, it's a kind of wishful thinking that's good to do that if you don't provide, let's say, hard data to support that. So this was one thing. Another thing that I think was a good take from here is to learn that some, let's say, divestment is already taking place, but I think much more is going to be needed. So I think also, but in order to support that or to see that movement really taking place, again, we have to have hard data, we have to have science, we have to have numbers to better justify and show that eventually this is the, goal, the way to go. And finally, let's say my third comment, uh, I was happy to see some comments on carbon budgets and things like that, but I was surprised that most of the references to carbon budgets here were related to a 2C world as opposed to a, a well below 2C. So let's say Paris is, is history already, but why we're still talking about a two degree world if 192 nations have signed that they are willing to, let's say they are willing for a world well below 2C. So well below 2C is not 2C is well below to see. So I'd like to see more discussions on that. And I was surprised to see that some of the results here were very much based on 2C world as opposed to 1.5 or something around that. These are my, my comments by now. And if 
course, it will be interesting to see how some of the work that is done here will link up to, of course, the, the one and a half C report that is coming out in the next uh, in the next few weeks. <coughs> Asia. Yes. Um, so I think for me, one one uh, takeaway is, is to see how um, the convergence between uh, supply and demand side policies is kind of starting, and it's being propelled by legal cases brought against. Um, uh, uh, fossil fuel projects that take into account uh, climate effects and disclosure standards and the quantifications that we saw of stranded assets and carbon bubbles. Um, so all of this uh, information is uh, informing um, on the effects of supply side policy. Then um, what was a little bit troubling for me is to see that the discussion of diversification pathways did not lead us to any maybe like clear um, understanding of what these pathways could be because yes, they tend to be, you know, very country specific. Um, but, you know, there was um, talk of how sovereign wealth funds can be used to diversify away the risk, um, though not much, um, it would have been nice to see how this is really happening uh, and being implemented. Uh, then we we um, know, you know also discussed how MDBs can can support fun, um, in guiding um, the diversification of uh, economies away from capital um, carbon intensive capital. Um, uh, and uh, lastly. Uh, what I got out of it is that we still have a lot, a lot of work uh, to do in uh, measuring support to um, the production of fossil fuels, whether it is from the um, government or the private sector, and uh, to see that not much has been um, done or uncovered in, in terms of the role of the financial sector uh, in channeling flows to fossil fuel projects. Um, and also uh, looking at different fiscal regime designs to understand to what extent governments are able to um, raise the revenues to ensure intergenerational um, equity and prepare or um, finance um, the, um, the transition. And then lastly, I mean, this, the work on producer subsidies would also inform um, on the, the effect of um, government support on the cost of capital for these um, producers. And, um, and I mean, we've seen uh, some, some papers treating this, but um, definitely something that needs to be uh, investigated further. I think this is it for me. Thank you. So inspired by the UNF triple C, um, I, I managed to encapsulate, to, to summarize uh, the conference in terms of my three Cs. Uh, so my, my first C is carbon entanglement. So I really heard this term or lock-in repeatedly uh, throughout the conference and so many presentations revealed the extent uh, of our carbon entanglement and, and the dimensions of it, the technological entanglement or lock-in, infrastructural, uh, policy inertia, another term. Um, I, I heard today, but also very much the, the, the political entanglements. There were so many accounts of how there's been capture, elite capture of policy processes by, by large fossil fuel companies, by, by other political elites. Um, and I think we have to be honest with ourselves and say there's also behavioral and cultural carbon entanglement. Of course, I don't think any of us would have got here without the help of, of fossil fuels in our, in our transport choices. And I think we have to be clear and honest um, about that as well. Uh, so my second C was co-benefits. And I think, again, this was a very consistent message that I heard from speakers um, talking about the situation on the ground. So policymakers, the public, much, much more concerned about local air pollution, about the health impacts of fossil fuels rather than climate change uh, itself. I mean, that's no surprise. We know, we know about that, but it's certainly something that um, activists can build on and I think now we're in um, you know, a geopolitical situation. We can, we can build on the integration of the climate change Paris goals uh, with the sustainable uh, development goals, I think, to really, really good, good effect. So my third C is, is coal. 
Um, so when I used to teach at Cambridge with students, we would talk about the governance challenges of climate change and how um, the fundamental problem is that we don't have a global government that can set rules and regulate um, on climate change. And I used to ask my students, OK, if you were the global government, if you were the global leviathan, what's the one thing that you would do to try and tackle uh, climate change? And you know, put myself in those shoes. If I, was, if I was the global government, I think based on all the presentations I've heard over the past two days, I think I would tackle coal. And how would I do that? I would specifically tackle new coal, yeah, both coal mines and coal-fired power generation in developed countries. And I would define developed countries as the Annex 1 countries in the convention, just to be very specific about that. Um, I think this would represent a worst-first approach. We all know that, that coal is obviously the most carbon intensive, intensive, and I think it would be consistent with concepts of, of leadership and justice that we've heard about quite a lot in several presentations. Uh, so I would work towards a total ban on new coal um, in Annex 1. So those are my three takeaways. All right, thanks. Well, then maybe picking up on, on your final point, um, if, if you were indeed, let's say, that, that uh, benign, not Sorry, dictator, not but, but, but yes. uh, benign global government, um, Obviously, that would be very nice, and maybe you could put in place those measures. But when we had the conference two years ago, um, maybe th there was enough optimism that some of these measures could actually be put in place uh, quite easily. Um, or well, e Maybe not necessarily easily, but, but um, there was movement towards these measures. Um, but of course, a lot has changed in the last two years. Uh, we, we've, had, um, we've had a lot of optimism, or we had a lot of optimism around that time, uh, around the Paris Agreement. They just had entered uh, into force uh, around the time of the last conference. Uh, we also had the, the fact that there was still President Obama at the time of our last conference. And now we have a, a slightly different president in the United States. It was pre-Brexit, <laughs> um, to take a more UK-based perspective. So a number of things have, have significantly changed. But at the same time, we also see now with movement towards countries stepping forward. And yes, they might be countries like New Zealand and, and Costa Rica, um, maybe also countries like France, who are actually taking supply side measures more seriously. We also have new coalitions come, uh, coming up. We have the Powering Past Coal Coalition. Today, another coalition was announced, uh, which is the, the coalition towards uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, so we see new emerging coalitions on, on issues related to fossil fuel supply. So maybe reflecting on some of these developments, maybe pointing in different directions, what would you see, how do you see the terrain changing for fossil fuel supply issues? And what does that actually mean for, for research and action on these issues? Um, again, keeping in mind that a lot of the, 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 the audience here is actually working on research or working on action. So any reflections that you have on this? And, and again, maybe to reverse it, I will start with you, Joanna. Start with somebody else? You want to start with somebody else? Well, start in the middle, exactly. Roberto. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not going to be talking too much different from what you just said, I think, and what I said before as well. I think the mood now is somehow more favorable in a sense that it's more acceptable to begin to talk about, let's say, supply side action. So it's not going to, let's say, shock people if you begin to talk about that because this is something that's already taking place. But in order, let's say, for this really to take off, I think we need to have, as I said before, hard data. It's not just a question to say we want to do that, but really have to, to be backed by sophisticated studies, reliable studies that really show the pros and cons of doing that for specific countries. Because, as was just said, let's say, one thing is the reality of developed countries. A completely different thing is the reality of a developing country, of a local population that's, let's say, is, it was expecting to improve life based on the natural resource and eventually someone is going to need to tell them that perhaps they will not be able to rely on that resource because climate change is a big issue and for them climate change is not a big issue, the big issue is what's going to be tomorrow. So I think that's why I think this community is doing a great job in raising the importance of that issue but this is not enough. Let's say what's really necessary is to use this community here to produce the studies that are going to support the argument that this is the way to go. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So I think I, I uh, for me, I think I have, I see right now two two things happening. Um, so for for the G20, um, for instance, uh, in their um, discussion of the energy transition, natural gas 
is going to be the fuel of the future. Um, and I think, so understanding um, the role of natural gas, support to natural gas, the effects of natural gas is, um, is, is going to be um, very important because this is what um, the main, uh, the largest economies are deciding that is going to be leading the transition towards uh, low carbon energy um, economy, sorry. And then I, th I think what we see uh, at the OECD is that there is this talk uh, uh, started by uh, in the uh, One Planet Summit uh, of last uh, December of um, part of the work on tracking financial flows is to have um, uh, green budgeting. And uh, so I wonder, I mean, um, it's very easy again to, to tag or to um, identify programs that benefit the consumption or the demand side. So I think we need help uh, identifying and tagging um, uh, things that are going to channel financial flows to the uh, supply side. Um, and so we are working uh, to see you know, um, countries' willingness to start um, these kind of uh, green budgeting efforts and see whether there is going to be room for um, supply side policies in that. And that's it, yeah. Yes, I've, I've spoken to quite a few colleagues over the past two days about optimism and pessimism. And um, I think for those of us who've been around quite a long time, it's, it's difficult not to feel pessimistic. I just wanted to remind the room if you, if you need reminding that it's, it's almost 30 years since the first UN General Assembly resolution on climate change. That was October 1988. It's 30 years since the IPCC was established. It's also 30 years since um, developed countries pledged to cut their carbon dioxide emissions by 20% by 2005 in the Toronto targets. Um, so if you take a very long view like that, it, it's difficult uh, to feel optimistic. Um, but having said that, I think it's certainly true that norms are changing. You can hear that, that the, that the mood music is, is very much changing. The fact that we're all here discussing this uh, must be positive. Um, I guess all about the new coalitions and initiatives that you mentioned, that there's been such a, a kind of spate of those. Um, it's become the, the new fashion, hasn't it, since Paris to announce all these new coalitions. Um, I remain to be persuaded that they're you know, more than just symbolic politics, and I'd like to maybe take stock of that in, in another two years' time. Um, in terms of the research agenda, uh, what I would like to see is much more work outside um, the West and outside the North. And I don't just mean developing countries, that's absolutely critically important, but also Russia, uh, the former Soviet Union, I think very much a, a neglected region. You know, that, that, that there's no, div there's no div divestment movement in Russia or Saudi Arabia or China even. You know, we, we have to slightly move away from um, our Western Northern focus. And um, one last thing is that it's very much with my editorial hat on, is what I really would like to see is greater engagement and a more concerted effort to bridge that very well-known gap between academia and policymakers um, and stakeholders. I mean, so often, yeah, Naomi's smiling, we were talking about that uh, at breakfast, so often academics are desperate to influence the policy process, you know, and NGOs and policymakers are desperate to have real data, you know, real research, and somehow, you know, the two don't seem... Uh, to mix, and obviously there's lots of very well-known issues there, but that's something I'd really like to see us both working on. I note your, um, your slogan, Bridging Science and Policy, so that's clearly something we can work together on over the next two years, Harry. Right, thank you, Joanna. Uh, Sheila? I find this a really difficult question to talk about, um, because it's kind of emotional, I think, in some ways, like if you're thinking about what's going on in the world. I think... Um, I think in some ways we're seeing a lot now on the surface that was hidden. So some of the things that we're seeing as kind of very negative and really backtracking, I would argue were there, but they were hidden. So perhaps it's actually good that we're seeing them. Although seeing your, I'm Canadian. So like more people agree now that Canada is a petro state maybe than they did before. Now that we bailed out a pipeline, that's you know, that would be seen as a kind of bad thing and backtracking, but there's a conversation about it that wasn't happening before. So I, I find it very difficult to talk forward in a kind of straightforward way about this, but I think, 
you know, what's happening is I hope that the progress that's being made in Paris means that a lot of interests are now much more with their backs up against the wall. That means they're going to fight harder, but that means we need to fight harder, but also they have to come out into the open. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about this extensively over drinks with anyone who wants to. Um, and I think what's going to happen, and I think as I think I've mentioned in the session before, is what we're seeing now is, and what we th I think will happen is actually governments are going to come to the table more and they're going to be coming to the table in all sorts of ways. Um, and the, and the, the state ownership is going up, the state investment is going up, and they are going to be in, and you know, they're going to be left holding the baby, if that's like a terrible analogy. But I think we really need to think about this. We need to think about how our government's going to manage this transition because in the end, that's, they, they own it, they hold it. It's, you know, so we, how do we help them to kind of navigate that? And, and it's getting more and more critical. Um, you know, the private sector, the market's being left to kind of manage the clean economy, but we really need to think about how we support governments to get through um, what's going to be tricky. Times. Thanks indeed. It's it's both a time for, for, for optimism and, and for, for pessimism in some in different different ways. Um, and that's I guess what, what I wanted you to reflect on. But I want to turn it over now to, to people in the in the audience. We have about 15 minutes and also looking at Michael. Um, and I just want to, to ask you to share your reflections, if any, on the conference organization, but also on the way forward for research, like future research questions, but also on the way forward for, for action and activism. What, are, what do you think um, should be done? But also, what do you think that conferences like this can, can, can do to, to help you achieve your goals? So any reflections that you want to share with the rest of the audience, uh, now is the time. So Zoa will be going around with, with the mic. Rick. Thanks, Rick, from Climate Accountability Institute. I first want to say that I applaud all the rich work that's been presented here, and um, I look forward to all of your contributions in the future in the next several years, as well as the organizers for putting together a terrific conference. I want to thank you first. Yeah. Uh, and what I found most engaging was starting to think, as, as many of you here do, about how do we unwind the, the carbon industry in a, in a reasonable way? How do we manage that decline? What is the corporate interest? How do they feel about it? What is, how are they going to respond to the pressure from us and our colleagues on and how to evolve their corporations, which have profited immensely? What is their reaction going to be legally and publicly? What kind of grassroots campaigns are they going to support in defense of the industry? So I'd like to see a panel of discussion about how corporations might respond to the public and legal and international pressure to unwind their industry in a direction that they may want, not want to go. I'd also like to see more discussion about how to engage the public in terms of the memes that we're discussing here. And even uh, I thank Michael for tweeting and for, for streaming these, these uh, events over the last two days, but we also need to think about how the public might perceive the message that we're discussing uh, overtly. Uh, perhaps there will be some more newspaper and, uh, and media presence here that can carry this forward for us. Uh, and lastly, uh, I wonder if we might think about some kind of atmospheric reparations trust that states and corporations may well willingly or um, be overtly asked to contribute to to help with the reparations that we know need to happen. Right, I see Michael over there, or, or Jonathan. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks, and uh, it's been a great conference. Uh, I just want to recall in the, the beginning, uh, there was a bit of a surprise when we did the poll. Um, inequity came uh, along beside supply side as the main barrier. Um, and I think to me, uh, one of the things about focus on supply side is uh, from that that I take is a focus on uh, the power of the industry and I think that links into the broader inequity um, and, and the growing um, sort of influence of authoritarianism and I think the um, sort of going back to the economic collapse and, and looking forward um, I think it, there's a powerful potential to to tie into that more to think about that more um, how can winning that that bigger battle or that more present battle than climate change uh, help with the supply side and um, I guess I would say uh, uh, the flip side of that is 
Um, to me, anyway, uh, there is uh, such a thing as being uh, too technocratic about supply side policy. Uh, yes, there is an economic rationale for it. Um, yes, it's complex. Um, but um, yeah, I'll leave it there. <clears throat> For first, the mic anyway. I'd like to follow up on two comments that Joanna made. And the first was her recognition of the importance of carbon entanglement and political inertia and elite capture. And the second was her pointing out the um, desperation or even frustration of analysts and modelers and other policy uh, assessment um, members of the community to actually reach and influence policy. And, and policy makers. And I think to a large degree, the first explains the second, that the elite capture explains the difficulty of reaching policy makers with our optimal strategies and such. And so um, as far as a subsequent session, I think it would be really interesting to have a conversation, an explicit conversation, panels between civil society and social movement actors who are working to unravel the political entanglement and shift power and analysts who, are, who might have some tools, might have some analysis, might have some frames that can help them change discourses and shift power. Hi there, thank you. Um, a really fantastic conference. Um, I had two very um, kind of discrete points. Uh, the first would be I think we need a Wikipedia page. There's no Wikipedia page for uh, um, the, what we're talking about here, and I, it may seem. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> is there one? I can't, all right, I couldn't find it. And the other, okay, in that case, I need to uh, Google better. But I thought the second, the second thing I was going to say is my experience talking to people who are not involved in this is when I say supply side climate policy, everyone looks confused. When I say supply control climate policy, everyone immediately gets it. So my plug would be that the discourse that we're engaged in here might better be transferred to the, to the rest of the world, to the broader public as supply control climate policy and as opposed to supply side climate policy, which I think gets, gets confusing sometimes. But yeah, fantastic, and I really think look forward to this being the start of a, a much broader conversation. Someone in the back there. I actually have oh, something James, really sorry. quick. Thank you. Um, also, a terrific conference. I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, I have just two kind of reflections. Um, one, I think a lot of us are sort of implicitly betting on and relying on renewable energy to really you know, take over for a lot of the fossil fuel production that we have now. And so it might be nice to you know, next time hear from some more of those renewable energy producers themselves, what barriers are they experiencing? Where do they see the inflection points and how could we formulate a coordinated approach working with them? Um, and then the second thing is, I think it's really valuable when we can actually have the uh, government policymakers at the table um, it's always a, a great thing to kind of connect advocates and government policymakers. So um, I think we should do more of that. Thank you. Uh, this has been a very inspiring conference. I. Um, I have become more optimistic. <laughs> and uh, the reason why I say that is that supply side policies will uh, will be more um, likely the more we get out of the demand side policies that we do, because it will be more it will be less costly to do supply side policies. But um, as is, we have no incentives yet for the for all the governments that might have thought about this uh, as, a, as a, an alternative. So we need to build some institutional incentives, perhaps within the UNFCCC system, to make that happen. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have two remarks. So uh, I saw some presentations on data. 
um, but they were so to, the, the methodology and the richness of the data set was pretty often uh, hidden in a broader narrative. And uh, as a modeler, I would be very much uh, interested in all the data that is available and what we can take into our models. Uh, so that would then also be a synergy and also uh, fields of cooperation. And the other remark uh, touches on uh, the uh, way uh, the presentations work. And I uh, have had sometimes the problem to follow simply because there was not a clear research question. And research questions are also are an important tool for communication, but also uh, to m clarify what is possible with divestment and what is not possible. I mean, uh, we may overhype divestment and not see the shortcomings, leakage effects, and other uh, things. And I think it is important to right size uh, the potential of these uh, policies or initiatives, activism, and so on. So what is really the potential? And what is, so to say, illusion? And yeah, thanks. Thank you. I'm just going to stand up if that's OK. Um, so I just want to say that I've really enjoyed this very uh, transdisciplinary audience where we have people from um, the, the public sector, the government sector, people from NGOs, academics, all coming together. And I've also uh, um, enjoyed the, the, the lack of um, like theory, academic sort of jargon and stuff, um, because a lot of the conferences I go to, I'm sort of wondering, like, what's this real world problem we're addressing? Um, what are we trying to do here? And uh, here we've got this very common agenda. And um, I've really enjoyed that. Um, so I guess some uh, two uh, future research agendas. I was really surprised. I live in Japan. In Japan, in Asia, I was surprised to see that there was no uh, panel or individual presentation that was addressing China. And um, I draw your attention to, a, I guess everybody's probably read it, but um, Jeff Tollison uh, commentary in, um, or perspective was it, in Nature, Can the World Kick Its Fossil Fuel Addiction Fast Enough? And he started off by drawing attention to our coal. And basically there was a quote there from another researcher saying that um, when um, solar booms, nobody notices, but when um, coal sneezes, the whole world knows about it. And the reason is because the re we've seen um, global emission CO2 um, peak or you know stop rising for two or three years and the reason was because um, Chinese consumption dropped so um this is such a huge topic and it's kind of surprising not to see um I guess either Chinese researchers here or us taking more of an interest um, in China and for that linked to that I appreciated very much the uh, presentation on India um coming back to this topic of coal that I've raised um I think that we've also put coal in one basket um of course um thermal um coal, like um, electricity generation is by far responsible for the lion's share of um, coal consumption, but steel and cement also have their own specific needs. So when we talk about coal, these are very different sectors. We're talking about different types of coal as well um, that have different uh, producing nations and different uh, manufacturing uh, sectors. So that kind of nuanced understanding was, I guess, not really present so much and it's probably a topic for the future, I think. A few more. We have one here in the front. Anyone else? If not, then Fernando. Yeah. I think that um, uh, a next step will be certainly to to combine in, in uh, saying, uh, to find synergies between the uh, the, the, the supply uh, approach and the traditional demand approach. I think that we made the case that uh, without the supply policy, we are not going to, to get fast enough. But the way of combining both is, is something that we have to, to delve into. And my, my second uh, recommendation for, for future uh, subjects for research is that uh, in the context of uh, disentanglement of governments from fossil fuels, I think that th there is a lot to be uh, studied and learned from uh, the real experiences of just transitions. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the situation of a very well uh, known member of the climate uh, uh, community, Teresa Rivera, who in Spain, she's given the ministry combining environment and energy. And, and she, she's suffering from uh, uh, a lack of sufficient scientific approaches to what it really means 
to have just transitions in place so that uh, we, we can move forward. Uh, beyond saying that uh, we create more than jobs than we destroy by the transition, which is true, but sometimes the, the job we create uh, are <laughs> elsewhere or are <laughs> happening at a different time. So to, to transform this concept of just transition from uh, just a mantra to, into a real uh, political choices in, in different contexts, not just in, in, in northern countries, as Joanna said, that, that would be tremendous uh, as, as, a, as a way forward. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks all for, for these reflections. I think a few takeaways that I see. Um, the first one, I guess, goes back to, to, to uh, one of the first slides that Michael showed at the conference on, on the scissors. Um, we know that we need both sides of the scissors, but actually, how do we cut? How do we bring them together? Um, and I think that is uh, an area that we've been, been, uh, been looking at and interested in at SEI as well. Uh, but it, it really requires a, a lot of very detailed thinking of how do you di bring different policy instruments together? How do you bring the different politics together? So I think there's a, a number of questions that will come up there. Um, another thing that I guess I got from uh, several of you is, is the messaging. Um, so basically, how do we bring this to the public? But what's also what, which words, which terminology do we use? Um, thanks for your suggestion, Michael, there. Um, but I think it's, it's something very much to keep in mind. Um, and you might see it reflected in the title of the next conference as well. Um, and then I guess one of the points that I gather from several of you also here on the table is the broadening of geographical coverage. Um, we always try to do that. We have tried to do this also with this conference, but it remains a challenge. And there will always be key countries that we haven't looked at. Um, and there were a number of suggestions made here that I think uh, we should look into also in, in the way forward. Um, before we say some closing words, um, I want to give the pa panel a final chance to, to give, offer some, some final reflections and, and, and takeaways for, for, the, for the audience. Um, and let me start by Sheila, if she, if she uh, has some, some suggestions. <coughs> Um, I think I think we see um, a willingness of uh, countries to open up their books, and I think uh, more and more. And um, so I think for us, it's going to be important for the, the external community to to support this process and 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 use the information that comes out of it. So um, yeah, that's all I I want to say. Um, and I had the last organisational point to make. Um, I wanted to thank the organisers for kind of walking, walking the walk and talking the talk. I, I really appreciated um, the efforts to green the conference, the vegetarian foods. I can't see any single-use plastic uh, anywhere, you know, minimal paper, none of those conference bags that disintegrate um, a, a week later. Um, and I think there's a serious point here. I think that all of us who are intimately involved in the climate change issue, I think it's incumbent upon us to set a good example, because if we can't do it, then we really can't expect the general public to do it. So I really appreciated the fact that that was reflected here. Thank you. It also means that the next conference might be virtual. So just so you know that. <laughs> <laughs> we well, can offset the flights. Exactly. <laughs> Right, Michael, um, I think we should say a few final words. First of all, thank the panelists for a really, really good contribution. You can just say here. Right, we'll say a few final things. Um, some important organizational remarks. Thank yous. Um, I'll start with a few organizational and follow-up remarks because these are usually the questions that, that you get at the end of a conference. So we'll try to preempt these questions and, and already let you know. So the question that you often get is what happens with the presentation? So what we intend to do is make drop boxes uh, with the presentations which are accessible to you. At the same time, we understand that some people do not wish to share their presentations uh, as files with others. If you're one of those persons, let us know and then we will not share. Um, all of the presentations that we will share will be shared as PDFs, just so you know. So that's the first, the first comment. Um, then um, publications. So several of you have submitted a paper uh, for consideration in publication in, in the Climate Policy Journal that uh, Joanna is editing. Uh, we will consider these papers in the coming weeks. Um, and we aim to get back to you by the end of October on that. And then we'll move forward with, with the editing process. 
Um, and then uh, finally, well, I guess it's the question that we've already answered in parts. Uh, one of the questions that we, we often have got, got also after the previous conference is what happens next? Will there be a next conference? I have a feeling also from the responses that I got that there will be a next conference. I think there's interest of people. We have at least four people willing to fund it. <laughs> so I think this, is, this should be fine. Um, <coughs> when it, ex will, it will happen exactly, we don't know whether we'll be as involved as we are now. We also don't know at this stage. But if you are interested in organizing a follow-up, whether it's at the international level or more regional level, whether it's more academ academic or more uh, focused on, on, on action and activism, just let us know and we'll be hap happy to engage and also share lessons learned. Michael. All right, a couple, couple more items um, A business. You may be wondering about those videos, if you want to go watch yourself. Um, <laughs> or maybe you don't, you want to watch everybody else. Uh, those videos will be available starting Monday, um, maybe sooner. And we'll send out an email message when they're ready. No, no, no pressure, Emily. Um, but you said that this room may be ready. Yeah, the ones that are live streaming will definitely be ready. Oh, those will be ready. First, the pressure is you. Um, so the other bit of business is don't forget to take your stuff. But if you do, those amazing porters at the front are the people you go ask, um, lost and found, etc. Okay. So um, four people want to fund this thing again. Um, uh, five. Well. You know, there is at least one person in this room who has helped fund this conference in a major way. And so, real big thanks go to Alex at KR Foundation. <laughs> we wouldn't be here today. Um, even though we got some funding as well, and we need to thank uh, the Swedish and National Development Agency as well as Formas providing funding to the um, SEI uh, initiative on fossil fuels and climate change, uh, that we were able to s provide some co-funding to that as well. So thank you again, Alex. That was really big. Um, thanks go to our co-organizers and co-sponsors, Australian National University, Cicero, Smith School at Oxford University, Energy Research Center at University of Cape Town, University of Eastern Finland, um, you can ask Haro what that means. Uh, Climate Strategies, Overseas Development Institute, and IISD. Thank you all for helping to steer this to get us where we are. So raise your hands, stand up where you are, stand up, you're already sit down. Just raise your hand so people know who you are. Thank you. The Steering Committee. Sheila, Gori, Frank, Roberto, Jesse, Iveta, and all those who couldn't make it, so that you know Andre Blakovich, did I say that right? Paul Eakins, Ben Caldicott, and Zipora, who unfortunately couldn't join us um, due to a family emergency. She really wishes to be here. Um, thanks to our special session developers. So we took the, the, um, the abstracts that many of you submitted. And that's how we knitted together those sessions. You wondered how those sessions some kind of come together. They, you know, they all fall together, but not exactly like one single research question per several. Uh, but for some of them, there was a really great synergy automatically because you organized it. And thanks go out to um, Chatham House, Union of Concerned Scientists, Wilderness Society, and ODI for organizing specific special sessions. So thank you all very much for those sessions. Uh, thanks go to our volunteers. Thank you, Naomi, Zoha, Kaya, where are you? <gasps> Kaya, and Jess for helping to make things run in every room, running those, those, this thing around fairly. Thank you guys so much. And there's two people who really, you know, are not standing up here quite as much as, uh, as Haro and I, but we're very, 
much part of organizing this whole thing and really would not be happening without. And that is Emily Yaley. Yeah. Emily. who made all of this, all this video casting that you have available, all the communications that you've had up until then, and Cleo Verkyle. <laughs> who, although she ran all the logistics, is an amazing researcher. And, um, and also, you may know through um, the Earth Negotiations Bulletin. All right, so with that said, um, oh, this is the thanks to all of you. <laughs> um, yeah, so inspiring. I mean, it, what, a, what a diverse a group of people and different perspectives. Um, sure, I heard that it would be great to have more industry folks here, and I, I appreciate Dominic for coming from Equinor and saying, okay, I'm the only industry person. We are trying to bring more of that along the lines of what you talked about there, Rick, about the idea of, of advancing this conversation in multiple fora. Um, and we heard lots of great ideas at the end that are inspiring about where to go next. What's amazing is that, you know, thank you for working on the issues that you're working on, the issues of our time, the big challenges, the, the unasked questions uh, until recently, and to pushing those ideas forward. So I leave inspired by the ideas and the, all those things that you lit up, the inspiration and so forth that you brought to us. So, where do we go from here? The King's Arms Pub <laughs> is right around the corner. So, all those connections, that, that whiskey that you didn't get yet, or the free, no, there's no free wine, the date, whatever it is that you're, um, you were enabled, the contacts you weren't able to make, head on over to the King's Arms. We'll see many of you there. And for those of the, you we don't, hope to see you again in one or two years. Thank you all very much.